Welcome to the intersection of spirituality, food, and the body. Thank you for joining. A few guidelines for this interactive presentation. These come from activist Lisa Marie Alatore, the Southern Law Project, and Training for Change. First, approach this material with curiosity, particularly around areas where you notice a strong or intense personal reaction. Second, stay engaged, whatever that looks like for you. Drawing, taking notes, stretching. Third, you may experience growing pains or discomfort. We are learning, unlearning, and relearning. Discomfort is distinct from unsafe. Expect a lack of closure. Integrating new information takes time. And honor the learning. If you leave with more questions than answers, that's a good thing. Speak through your truth. We're not the same people we were in the past. Speak from I, think from we. And lastly, trying on is not taking on. This material might prompt thinking about something in a new way or trying on new language. Culturally sensitive treatment is a topic that is important to me both personally and professionally. I'm multicultural, a child of documented immigrants, and I identify as a spiritual person and one who holds privilege because of my familiarity with Christianity, which comes with the societal advantages here in the U.S. and in many colonized countries. Additionally, I identify as someone who is passionate about food, a learner, and an eating disorder specialist. These identities, plus my other privileged and marginalized identities, influence how I think about and interact with these topics and my overall lived experiences. I first started my professional eating disorders career over 10 years ago, and I quickly noted that the clients we served in treatment settings were primarily white, thin, able-bodied, and young with healthcare access or a means of paying for treatment out of pocket. Spirituality was periodically incorporated into treatment, but it really seemed like there were few resources to facilitate these conversations. I questioned how we could provide high quality treatment if we didn't consider how cultural identities, including spirituality, intersected with clients' overall experiences and their healing. To this day, I continue to raise these questions and advocate for inclusion in the eating disorders field. I believe we have a responsibility to create inclusive, equitable, and welcoming spaces to serve all clients with eating disorders and to serve them well. As we get started with this presentation, I encourage a bit of a warm-up reflection. What are your goals or intentions for this time together? Take a moment to connect with that intention. The relationship between food and spirituality is really a complex and beautiful one. Spirituality refers to human beings' subjective relationship to what is unknowable about existence, and how a person integrates that relationship into a perspective about the universe, the world, others, self, moral values, and one's sense of meaning. Our experiences of spirituality are highly subjective and extremely diverse. They deal with the fundamental essence that is human belief, a universal topic that spreads across different cultures, civilizations, and timeframes. Food, like spirituality, is also universal. Both are not merely about theories or concepts, but they are deeply embedded in the practical elements of life. Food is a multidimensional aspect of human life, entailing psychological, physical, to emotional features and it is independent of any particular theories or subjective views. Food is also influenced historically and presently by a whole host of factors. Food consumption plays a significant role in an individual's social and cultural identity development. Proximity to food varies, with women historically sharing the closest relationship to food. 
Many argue that this proximity is especially relevant when we consider food as a psychological outlet to seek control of one's life, like food asceticism and its association with sainthood and high religiosity, especially notable in history. Food preparation is similarly embedded within rich historical, socio-political, cultural factors and layers. For example, food acquisition via hunting has been reported by the Inuit to provide spiritual satisfaction of feeling self-sufficient. Rituals and practices concerning food consumption allows one to make choices and get closer to their heritage and religious traditions. Food rituals are prominent across time, region, and culture. For example, in Mayan times, food rituals held spiritual obligations and social relationships that facilitated communion when it came to feeding spiritual entities. Food serves not only to satiate hunger and provide physical nourishment, but also as a spiritual resource, an expression of love for deities, higher powers, nature, and connection with others. In Hindu religious tradition, certain temples offered food as an act of servitude to ensure collective prosperity of kingdoms. Food consumption is generally a social process. We often eat in community and share food together. This connection is established not only with the divine, but also with one another. Our family, community members, and elders serve important roles in this often as our first teachers who impart the importance of food as a family tradition. The complex relationship between food and spirituality is relevant to conversations about eating disorders because eating disorders impact clients physically, socially, emotionally, and spiritually. Nourishment is a necessity. Eating disorders are life-threatening, yet not always visible. These diagnoses can occur regardless of body shape, size, weight, or ability. Given the tremendous impact these disorders have on the body and mind, it's not surprising that eating disorders are the most lethal of all psychiatric conditions, second to opioid use disorders. People with eating disorders also have an increased risk of dying by suicide. Eating disorders co-occur with other mental health issues, including mood disorders, trauma, and physical conditions due to behaviors, such as abnormal heart rates, edema, organ failure, muscle loss, and electrolyte imbalances. Eating disorders also often co-occur with substance misuse, up to 50% of individuals with eating disorders abused alcohol or illicit drugs, and also 35% of individuals who have abused or were dependent on alcohol, of, alcohol or drugs have had an eating disorder. Eating disorders thrive on shame, secrecy, isolation, and disconnection. These maladaptive coping mechanisms offer a facade of power, control, and predictability, but at the cost of our sense of self, connection, and communities. Eating disorders impact all racial and ethnic groups, with research suggesting that relative to whites, eating disorders are more prevalent in our Asian communities, that Asian and Latin men struggle with more eating pathology, drive for muscularity and muscle dysmorphia relative to their white counterparts. And additionally, black women experience binge eating and binge eating disorder at similar rates to their white counterparts, yet have some of the lowest treatment access. Eating disorders are prevalent or more common among members of the queer community and also among members with low socioeconomic status. Despite these prevalence rates, eating disorders are underdetected and undertreated in marginalized communities. Eating disorders occur when there is behavioral disruption and misuse with food or how nourishment is processed and eliminated from our bodies. 
Behaviors are often categorized by restriction, purging, and binge eating, and they can occur alone or in conjunction with others. Eating disorders often occur on a continuum, and so there are disordered eating practices um, all the way to clinically significant eating disorders. And behaviors, frequency, severity, and distress criteria must be met for a clinical diagnosis, yet treatment is possible without one. Subclinical presentations are also as lethal and serious as clinical ones. The complexity in the relationship between food and spirituality is evidenced by mixed research findings about this relationship. Research suggests that spirituality mediates or exacerbates eating disorders through associated psychological variables like depression, anxiety, self-esteem, and body satisfaction or dissatisfaction. Some research suggests there may be specific aspects of religiousness that are protective, such as seeing one's body as sacred, or a stronger commitment to one's religion, praying and using positive religious coping, which has been associated with more body satisfaction and fewer unhealthy eating habits. Other studies suggest that certain aspects of religiousness have negative associations with body image and eating pathology. For example, insecure attachment to God predicted bulimic symptoms among women, and women are more likely to report dieting if they experience negative support from religious community, such as feeling judged or criticized. If they engaged in negative religious coping, or if they endorsed having a close relationship with God. People who mention bullying within their own religious communities have also reported that this prompted or perpetuated their disordered eating. A note about the research. The majority of it has focused on white Christians, uh, cis female heterosexual samples. This is important because it can limit some of its gen generalizability and so we need to be mindful of these limitations. Please note that the language referencing God, higher power, and clients as female is most frequently discussed in the research, and that is why it is noted in several of, the, of these slides to mimic um, and illustrate that language. Fasting practices exist in almost all religious and many spiritual communities. These practices may be double-edged. On one hand, may facilitate a locus of spiritual communication and development. On the other, they may be risky, particularly for individuals at a high risk for developing eating disorders. And they may be used for weight or appearance alteration. Dietary restriction may be similarly double-edged. On one hand, used for aligning with spiritual and ethical values. And on the other, it may, may be used to justify restricted variety, food avoidance, or perpetuate rigid and restricted eating behaviors. Check in for a moment. What's standing out for you? Feel free to jot that down. And let's talk a little bit more about culturally sensitive treatment and the importance of it. The importance of culturally sensitive treatment is vital um, to addressing health disparities and inequities. Though our individualistic society may promote thinking otherwise, we live in larger systems and contexts that are culturally informed and culturally reflective. Treatment relationships are formed in these contexts. The processes, the modalities, we pull into treatment settings. Those are all influenced by larger contexts. And culture, including spirituality, impacts how we connect, how we create treatment relationships. Treatment adherence is improved with culturally sensitive treatment. Patricia Marsden and colleagues who write on eating disorders and spirituality found that clients often understood their eating disorder in religious ways and that spirituality enhanced the motivation and improved treatment adherence. They note for patients with strong religious faith, spiritual practice is helpful in recovery 
and spiritual maturation goes hand in hand with positive psychological changes. Honoring clients' preferences and agency is vital to culturally and spiritually sensitive care. We take a client-centered approach, seeking to work within clients' religious or spiritual framework and values. We similarly seek to learn and use the language of client spirituality rather than imposing our own spiritual language or values. This reminds me of a therapeutic stance of cultural humility, which is defined as a lifelong commitment to self-evaluation and critique, to redressing power imbalances, and to developing mutually beneficial and non-paternalistic partnerships with communities on behalf of individuals and populations served. Ella Green Moten, activist and community organizer, describes cultural humility as a spiritual attribute, drawing from the ability to be humble and state and, and couched in a state of selflessness. There's a process of self-reflection and self-critique that those with a posture of cultural humility take, one that leads to acceptance and profound respect of cultural backgrounds. We are in this together. During informed consent procedures, it is advisable for us to explicitly tell clients that it's okay to talk about religious and spiritual issues during treatment, if the client wishes. We encourage clients to take the lead in their spiritual journey. This, re this includes, for us as practitioners, respecting that clients may decide to discuss spiritual issues during some sessions and not during others. If at any point clients seem uncomfortable or unwilling to discuss spiritual issues, we should respect their preference and treatment should proceed without a spiritual focus. In establishing a spiritually safe environment, we adopt a broad definition of spirituality as it gives clients the opportunity to figure out what spirituality means to them. Barrett et al., who are researchers on this topic, note that religious activities and practices such as attending church, reading scriptures, praying, and so on, are potentially an important and helpful, but that spirituality is really much more than these practices. Spirituality includes experiences such as feeling compassion for someone, loving, accepting love, being able to feel hope, receiving inspiration, feeling enlightened, being honest and congruent, feeling gratitude, and feeling a, feeling a sense of life, meaning, and purpose. As clinicians, we must communicate interest and respect when clients self-disclose information about their religious tradition and spiritual beliefs. Before using any spiritual resources and interventions that are in harmony with the client's beliefs, we must assess whether patients wish to include spirituality in their treatment. As clinicians in establishing a safe therapeutic environment, we need to also keep in mind potential ethical pitfalls, including dual relationships, imposing religious values, um, displacing or usurping religious authority and violating work setting boundaries. Eating disorder assessments are comprehensive and thorough, exploring the client's functioning in terms of physical, nutritional, psychological, social, and spiritual well-being. These assessments can be lengthy, but they are relevant and important for gathering history and being able to assess motivations, consequences, feelings, thoughts, perspectives, and the impact of a client's eating disorder behaviors. When we assess with, with sensitivity, we tend to each of these areas with great care, conveying respect for the client's beliefs and agency. In conducting a religious or spiritual assessment, our goal is to gain a clear understanding of the client's current spiritual framework to generate a treatment plan that is sensitive to the individual's belief system. There is, of course, both an art and science to this, we avoid trivialization of client spirituality, which can be extremely painful and undermine the therapeutic relationship. 
Our broad definition of spirituality, which we discussed shortly, provides an opportunity to allow us as clinicians to understand the client's beliefs about what spirituality means to them, to explore what clients truly want, how they want their spiritual life to be, how they want to incorporate spirituality into treatment, recovery, their life. We also look to understand the client's background experiences, including areas of spiritual conflict, impasses, difficulties, and areas that are uplifting or strengthening for them. Assessing with sensitivity allows us to understand more of the depths of our client's motivations and really to decipher if religious or spiritual motivations are being used as justification and if they are associated with emotional distress. Spirituality and food are very personal, influenced by feelings and our subjective experiences. They can be sources of strength and stability. And so in honoring clients' spiritual values in the treatment process, we can support clients in the process of spiritual reconnection of self to the body, nature, and society. Some clients may endorse religious trauma or display symptoms consistent with trauma experiences. Religious trauma is defined as pervasive psychological damage resulting from religious messages, beliefs, and experiences. Unlike trauma related to acute incidents, religious trauma generally accrues gradually through long-term exposure to messages that undermine mental health and they can impact people interpersonally, emotionally, and cognitively. Religious trauma shares many symptoms with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and complex PTSD, and can also be used to describe the experiences of people disaffiliating from authoritarian and dogmatic religious systems. Assessing for religious trauma respectfully and safely is vital, especially when we're working with the LGBTQIA or queer community and people who have experienced conversion therapy and other marginalized folks. In the interest of time, we won't discuss spiritual interventions in depth. However, I want to note a few more clinically relevant areas that can be helpful for developing and delivering interventions. First of all, spiritual interventions may not be a good match for all clients. Per Richards and Bergen, they may be riskier and less effective when patients are young, severely psychologically disturbed, anti-religious or non-religious, spiritually immature, or for whom or for folks who view spirituality as irrelevant to their presenting problems. These are important considerations for clinical appropriateness. Second, I want to offer this conceptual framework developed by Richards and colleagues that delineates the role of spirituality in eating disorder treatment and recovery. We have discussed elements of this throughout the presentation, and through this framework, ultimately, the goal is to move from spiritual disconnection toward spiritual connection. Clinicians and clients initially unpack how spiritual connection has been lost in the drive to maintain an eating disorder or maintain the eating disorder behaviors. I encourage you to read the article, the uh, article by Richards at all 2018 for more information. The inclusion of family members may enhance treatment engagement. Family members are able to help with appointment reminders, transportation, assuming caregiving responsibilities, and be sources of support. Families and individuals may not realize that distress is indicative of an eating disorder, and so education and inclusion of family can be vital to being able to, to create opportunities to understand. Healing from an eating disorder is often a lengthy process. Family and social supports may have their own spiritual beliefs and practices that influence how they engage in the therapeutic process and manage supporting a loved one with an eating disorder. Positive and negative spiritual coping may have different effects. For example, a study conducted a few years ago by Busser and colleagues found a significant association between spiritual discontent, religious coping, and depression. 
As treatment providers, it is prudent to assess the spiritual belief systems that inform how family or social supports cope with the stress of being close to a loved one with an eating disorder. It is wise for us to explore the types of spiritual coping tools being used. Additionally, it's important to understand conflicts and concerns between spiritual beliefs and treatment practices and investigate these further. Equitable and high quality eating disorder treatment must incorporate intersectionality. Eating disorders impact all of these marginalized communities, and I highly recommend reading the work of Kimberly Crenshaw to learn more about intersectionality and to also look up um, the growing body of research on eating disorders and intersectionality, if this is an area of interest. Education, training, and community outreach through activities like these, uh, like this one here, are important for increasing awareness about eating disorders and how these intersect in our relationships with food, spirituality, and the body. Taking courses, reading books and articles, watching videos, listening to podcasts about world religions, the psychology of religion, and spiritual approaches for counseling and psychotherapy all promote increasingly thinking about how spiritual, spirituality and eating disorders intersect, how we can understand clients' experiences with greater sensitivity, and how we can support the healing process. The more we dialogue about what we're learning about, the more we support others in doing similarly. We are better equipped to help identify warning signs and address myths and misconceptions about eating disorders and challenge the, challenge the stigma of struggling with mental health. The following questions can be helpful for identifying training needs and opportunities for growth. And I want to end with some notes of hope. We hold hope for our community members struggling with eating disorders and support for healers involved in their care. We are part of a collective that fosters empathy, compassion, persistence, and patience. These factors are integral to the recovery process. Recovery from an eating disorder is a biopsychosocial spiritual process, a lengthy labor. As healers, we are encouraged to be timeless timely and tireless, inclusive and greedy in our efforts to reach all those at risk and patient and persistent as we collaborate and care. By working together, we create healing spaces to lessen the misconceptions, pain, shame, fear, isolation, and turmoil impacting those with eating disorders while promoting culturally sensitive and affirming care. I'll leave you with this question. Where do we grow from here? And here's my contact information if you'd like to reach out with any questions and the references. Thank you for joining.